The second program in the series of Heydays and Alstocks is about Mikhail Road. Its past, its future, its life, its people. This program was made with the support of Sound and Vision, Broadcasting Funding Scheme, a BCI initiative. On New Year's Day 1936, local castle bar curate Father Carney had a historic duty to perform. The first tenants in Ireland's largest local housing estate in the Republic of Ireland at that time saw their new homes officially blessed and McHale Road was born. It was a telling moment in the history of Castle Bar as families from New Antrim Street, Lucan Street, Charles Street, Sawling, Tucker Street and Gallows Hill to name but a few began a new life. The new tenants were moved to McHale Road because the houses they lived in were officially condemned by the council. And for those lucky enough to acquire one of the 116 houses built, it heralded a new beginning. McHale Road was planned by Castlebar UDC in 1933, with contractors Malloy and Sons and Glynn and Tobin awarded the contract to build durable working class houses. The site was on both sides of a cart track used mainly by farmers to bring pigs to the local bacon factory and was located on what was once Lord Lucan's farmyard. The site wasn't without its problems in construction stage, with 24 of the houses constantly sinking during construction that led to houses numbered 37 to 60 eventually having to be built on a floating foundation. The tenants were in the main young married couples and for families like the Nearys, Guthries, Gallagher's, Roaches, Ryan's, O'Connor's and Cresham's, it was a dream come true. Few of the families could have realised at that time the significance McHale Road would have on Castlebar in the intervening 70-odd years. McHale Road has become an institution with scholars, musicians and poets mingling comfortably with craftsmen, writers, housewives and tradesmen. The estate became home to numerous rambling houses, Cayleys and card games for the older generation, with the youngsters making their own entertainment, playing soccer in the middle of the streets, negotiating competitive games of marbles under the dim lights of the ESB poles, and watching plays in Macalyn's shed at number eight. This is the story of a road that to this day has an atmosphere like no other, where people still matter most, where neighbors look out for one another, and above all else, where pride in the place still prevails. Welcome to the road, its story, its folklore, and its people. The early years in McHale Road saw lots of emigration in Castle Bar. Times were tough, but for Chrissy Doherty, Paddy Moylet, Stephen Guthrie and Phil Heenan, all young people growing up on the road, their memories are ones of happy times. Well, first of all, I was six when I came to McKay Road, from Lucan Street. There was no facilities, toilets in Lucan Street, and the thing that got my eye when I moved to McKay Road was the long chain in the toilet, flushing the toilet. It was a novelty, flushing the toilet. My father was in England, had to go to England then, and my mother was left with us, like, you know, and my brother Michael joined the army, and my brother Sean worked in the hat factory. And there was a lad above two doors from us, Christy Welch, used to build hut, huts down the back road, and a lad four doors down used to build another hut. And to get into those huts, we had, Christie's was nicer than Michael McHale's, was tuppence, and a penny to get into Michael's, and it was great to get in and talk about the old stories like. So the new potatoes would be coming up in the garden and we do not put in our hand and pick up a stalk and a stalk of carrot and we'd get a tea tin and we'd build a little fire. We'd sit around the fire making our pasta stew. <laughs> Anyhow, if we come Halloween and we'd all be out knocking at the doors. So Mrs Brady, she had a clothes shop where Parsons is now, and she used to come around collecting skins for her pigs. 
And we used to love to see her coming because she was a lordly lady. She had a lord dress. But she used to pull it up and she had a big scissors. We used to tie the gates. And she used to... And we got such a kick out of this, like, you know. So anyhow, you know, when, when the crowd was just growing up and money was scarce. And we, the ways we earned it was when our dinner would be over... When the skins, there was a woman down the road, had pigs. We go down, I go down with the skins, I get four pence, right? Well, that's one of us gone to the pictures. The pictures was only four pence then. And then there was nylons. They had pigs. The next day we go up to them. Oh, we, we had two, the two of us go to the pictures. So then they used to have variety in the cinema, singing. And we used to love to go down there at half seven and listen to everyone singing. And then going off to school in the morning, the summer morning, wash her hair, and Mr. Pelly used to be out shining the bell. And I used to love ringing the bell and to get to run from him. And sometimes I'd take the shortcut home from school through the lawn to get the nuns to follow us. And the nuns used to have the borders out doing the hair, and we'd be sitting on this big wall watching the warders making the hay and the nuns will come down oh and give afterwards you know it was lovely going up in K Road and everyone was your friend because if you got into trouble everyone was there to back you and then we'd be dying for my mother to go out to the films and then they'd be all in our house and we'd be making toffee with the butter and the sugar and the whole lot and a sing along growing up in K Road was beautiful and the happiest times of my life yeah, I was the second child born on McGay Road. And uh, another lad, he was um, named Tommy Whitaker. He was born in number 29, McGay Road. I know there was 14 or 15 of them in family. And they all immigrated to England. And I haven't seen him since the day he left. Was it? He was the first child born on McGay Road. He was known as Party, The great man for uh, greyhound racing and after ferrets and what have you. It was a great character. Now one time we'd be mostly on McKay Road, playing football, playing hurling, you name it. It wouldn't be hurdles now you'd have, it'd be what they call lumps of sticks or whatever. And we'd be belting on the road there for hours. Hours there was no you didn't have to be looking for a car coming left or right, there was no cars. There were no footpaths. And where McHale Park is now there was there was just a galloping eyes around it. Growing up on McHale Road, like, you know, in fairness, and I'm sure nobody would mind me saying this, that there was very little. You know, we had the bacon factory and that was fine. That was great because it employed a huge amount of people. But, uh, you know, I, I remember the time that there was no bathrooms in McHale Road. I remember the time that I might be asked to hop in over the neighbour's wall and ask for a cup of milk. And in return, like, the neighbours probably passed to shoot over the following morning for a cup of sugar or that, you know. And it was absolutely lovely. You know, there was no bitterness, there was no resentments or hatred. You know, McKay Road was a fantastic place all those years ago. It's still a fantastic road. You know, uh, the, the people on McKay Road, they're, they're, they're unbelievable characters. Well, it was wonderful. The kids had great times. We innocent games. Chrissy, my old friend, and all the people, we just borrowed dresses from each other, shoes from each other to go to the dances. It was just great. Just loved it. And we have wonderful neighbours. Best in the world. Oh, and my mother and father were just great. My mother was a one-off. I always said she was a hard act to follow, and she certainly is. Dad died very young. He was only 56 when he died. I was in America when he died. And um, he worked very, very hard. He never lived to see the good times. My mother did. We had her in America three times. She was in London with us. She was in Lancashire. Everywhere we ever lived, we had our mother with us for a holiday. And it was wonderful. The Kayleys, card games, street fun and rambling houses were part and parcel of life on the road. Everybody had a party piece. And as this programme reminisces on the past, Lily Guthrie's version of For All Time's Sake is very apt. Just for all time's sake, won't you give my heart a break? Let's get together again. 
Let's relive the time I was yours and you were mine. Life was so wonderful then. Songs and stories were almost as popular as sport on the road. From footballers to soccer players, basketballers to handballers, the road had it all. Johnny Mee, Kevin O'Malley and Paddy Moylet now recall the contribution McHale Road made to sport in both Mayo and further afield. Very strong association with sport. We always had good footballers. Andy Rebbind was a great goalkeeper. Uh, that tradition was followed by Parik Krisham. Again, he was a wonderful goalkeeper. Joe Fye, Tommy Burden, who I think was on the 50-51 team, he certainly was on the panel. He was, he was a, a fine goalkeeper as well. Like So there's always been a very strong association with sport. I'm just thinking Josie Feeney, for example, he has won a number of Connacht Junior Cups and he played, with, played for Ireland with great distinction on a number of occasions. So there is a very strong affinity with sport, and that's still there today. Can I remember one particular occasion, it must be 50 years ago, Michael here used to always, he used to always walk up to the, to, he never drove Michael Litton, and he used to walk up and he'd be broadcasting the matches. And I remember he said, young man, he said, I'm dying for a cup of water. And I brought him into the house, sure my poor mother got be good to us all over. Will you have a cup of tea or grow? No, he said, ma'am, all I want is a cup of water. And he went in and of course he, he brought the games alive at that time. We had a great club called Road Rangers and I was associated with it and uh, very much with the club. And, and it ran about three or four years. Pat Quigley was also, he was the last season, Pat was the secretary of the club. And as you know, he went from there right up to be president of the FI, which is the highest office in the land. But um, we had, and it was great, and we'd meet Celtic, of course, at that time. We used to have great, oh, talk about rivalry, it was rivalry, and it was Rangers and Celtic, I can tell you. It was hot stuff. That team that came out that time, it was really a third team in Castlebar, because Celtic that time had an E and a B side. And there were quite a few lads that weren't getting football, so the, we all got together. In fact, Hackley Course was the main uh, instigator of forming the club. There was uh, Frank Lord and Jody Scully, Lord and Mr. David, the late Frank Scully and uh, Frank Blake also. And there was a, a lot of the old times that was with Celtic. We all came in together. And in fact, there was a few players that, that played with Celtic for two or three years. They were retired and we pulled them out of retirement and got them fit to play at Celtic. That was Desi Ends with Mike Neary and Joe Fye was, who was once a, also a great Mayo goalkeeper. And so we bet Celtic, and Celtic had a great team that time in the Connick Cup, and we used to rent the pitch from Celtic, so after beating them, they actually refused us the pitch, although we paid them for it. So Eamon Clark and myself went up to, we got in contact with the Lance Stewart first, Matt Shaw and St Mary's, and Matt said he wouldn't have any objections, and uh, so also Dr Gilvary, we made a appointment with him, and we explained to be grateful for the patience. St Mary's was idle at the time, it was a lovely ground, so... A lot of the lads got together and we were just one week to get the pitch ready. We were playing Bellana and uh, so the pitch wasn't great for him. Joe Fye, I lost, he used to drive the ambulance at that time and Joe went to, to Dublin. He bought the nets and the football and all that stuff. And the late Willie Basquell uh, actually made the goal post. And to one thing or other anyways, and everyone got together and the, the pitch was in great order. And we had St Mary's up to the very end. There used to be a lot of slagging going out in the sidelines which is often here and it says, Celtic have the ground and Rangers have the money. That was the slag news going on that time. But there uh, were great times. It was always well known as a soccer road. So it was all soccer. I'd say the best player locally was Josie Feeney, backwise. And I think I have a friend in America, and I think he was the, one of the best players I've seen. He won a Connor Cup when he was only 16 or 17 above in Galway. And his name is Billy Crisham. He was a beautiful footballer, and he was a very, very good Gaelic player. I'm certain he played for the Mio Miners in a Connacht final in McHale Park. But he was a beautiful footballer. But he was very. He, he left for America when he was very young. And, but he was a brilliant footballer. We had brilliant footballers on McHale Road. Brilliant sportsmen they might have been, but soccer and Gaelic football didn't bring in the money to feed the many mouths of McHale Road's increasing population. Money in those days was scarce, and so too were jobs. The arrival of the Castle Bar Bacon Factory proved to be a godsend, with individuals from practically every house on the road working there to bring in a weekly wage packet. The work was appreciated, but it wasn't easy. And Ollie Roach, Chrissy Doherty, Michael Feeney, Michael Fallon, Mickey Guthrie and Paddy Moylet have some incredible memories of how they brought home the bacon. 
Well, in my case, I was there in uh, 56. I was 30 years in it. Started in the Wilder House with Paul Holmes, bringing in the coal. The barrow was bigger than me. Paul Holmes was my boss. A next door neighbour, actually. He's dead now. Lord have seen him. Pound a week. Come home to the mother and handed it up. The lot. And whatever you got was really little after. That's where I started. Anyway. That time was 48 hour a week. So you worked until 12 o'clock on a Saturday. I was a month off 14 actually. I was dividing the guy that was over us. You had to be 14. I, you know, you, you, you wouldn't legally. But that time things were kind of easy. Do you know what I mean? Well, it was a big part of my life, yeah. Big part of it, yeah. Spent uh, about 25 years in the bone room with 70 other guys. Quill taking out bones at the start. Then I was trained as a butcher. Well, I went into the baking factory at 14, and I got 150 a week. And I thought I'd never get up to give it to my mother. And my mother used to say to me, the baking factory dinner is coming. Here's 10 shillings. Go down to Richard Prindigas. That was a close-up down the main street. Put so much on the dress, right? That's the way we used to pay off the dresses. And Parvix Flynn's mother, who was a lady down Castle Lane, we go there and I open another dance we come and we pay off the dress. The taffeties was all to go that time. And she was lovely to go into Mrs. Flynn. A tough place to work, let no one say otherwise. It was a tough place to work. Conditions were not ideal. Um, left a lot of people with problems uh, health-wise. You were working in heat, extreme heat and extreme cold. That was about the size of it and very hard, very hard work. When the whistle blew in the morning, you'd hear it here. 8 o'clock. You had to be at your post at 8 o'clock, not thinking about getting out of bed or having a cup of tea. You were at your post at 8 o'clock and you didn't leave till 1 o'clock. You were working a half day Saturday as well to put in your week. like, And you were working till 6 o'clock in the evening. Every evening. But then you had a half day Saturday. It was a tough grind, it was the baking company. But it was an education. I had to say that. And there was a, a lovely joviality among the staff. You knew so many people, huge volumes of people down there, huge volumes. At, at times it would go up five and six hundred and busy, very busy periods. I got to know so many people. I was working in maintenance for the most part of my time in it, refrigeration and boilers and that type of thing. It would bring me into sort of contact with every department. I'd be going around and meeting everyone. So I knew what was going on everywhere. But it was a, a great employer. I'd give it its due. It was a, a good earner. If you were prepared to, to, to work overtime, but I mean, you were talking all work and eight in the morning to six, you'd be well tired, physical hard work. But there was overtime for you if you wanted to do it, and you got well paid for it. So you, you had the opportunity to make work, uh, make money, get yourself started in life. And so many people from this street, and there was five and six out of a lot of the families, worked in it, um, men and women, and it was a great employer. Myself and my father worked in the factory. My other brothers and sisters, two brothers worked in the head factory. That was my family. There was one man who used to do all, all the paychecks, and you remember him well, Frank Griffin. No computer. No, no computer or nothing. All written down. Written down. 650, and out of every house on this road, you had three or four workers, right or wrong. Yeah. I've seen five of my four brothers and one sister yeah, working there. And but there were happy times, there were good times, but the money wasn't great, you know. But you got on with it. If you got a bit of overtime, it brought up your bit of a wage. <laughs> you had to do what you were told to do. You be only finished one job, and you were shoved into another straight away. It, I, my job in the bacon factory was chaining pigs. In other words, I was a killer. I had to be chained for slaughter, right? I'd send them up alive. You know, and the squealing of them was something desperate. And there was no such thing as these mufflets on you. You had to bear that nice. Because it's got the smell of blood, they were afraid of their lives going in. I mean, it had to be done. That was my job, and i seen... Uh, I never forget it. We got two breaks one morning. Uh, I seen two and a half thousand pigs and nearly 400 sows in that place up there. They were all over the place. We got two breaks. You had to cut up from the kill before the day before. 
and get most of that done you'll be told to get ready another kill going on so I came in that had to be done so they were taking them off hooks and they were, I don't know where they were throwing them but the hooks had to be got to, for that kill the next day that time in my time you went to the station I remember going up to the railway station here you drive cattle down McHale Road they came in on the goods train sows, pigs people out at mine you're bringing down the animals at their gates looking out at you and you were looking up the back road to see was there one or two missing or gone or jumping here and there and you might bring three or four with you but you'd have to guard the back, back roads to just keep them away I thought they were going in for a game of football and they came back one day. <laughs> but there was one certain man who used to bring in pigs and they were called land racers. He never reared them inside. He used to rear them out in the land. He brought in those three pigs this day and they made a bolt for the, <laughs> they made a bolt for the door and jumped it. I said, gee, I said, greyhounds. They were like greyhounds. They were like greyhounds. And they made a bolt for the lawn. So we were sent up the lawn, myself and Paddy Gannon, the Lord of Mercy. Uh, Paddy the bull. And there they were, the three of them above in the lawn. And you swear now they, were, they knew what we were after. They were, look, they were hiding behind the trees. <laughs> <laughs> it was a hiding go seek job to me. So eventually we got them back. At an arm expense. <laughs> But we, 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 we kept them going, you see, because it kept us really out. We, we, did, we didn't want to capture them that quick to get back in a hurry because it was over time for us as well. <laughs> because those pigs had to come back. <laughs> so anyhow, we got them back. But one man had to be inside the gate in case they'd make a bolt the second time. And if they did, it was all over. So half the air was out guiding the main. <laughs> the work was stopped. And they were outside bringing in these three pigs. And I was inside with an iron bear. And then he would, it was murder, surely. All I could do was knock them out. And then pull, pull them up. This is gospel throw. Because they were going to make a bolt again. <laughs> you can ask the boys there. I went through millions. Not, not, not. not How many not, a day? How oh, many a day? <laughs> for the five days. Oh, for the five days. You'd, in a busy period, uh, you'd be going through. You'd be going through six, seven thousand, at least, for the week. I used to chain them, and then there was a man inside me again that had to stick them to lose the blood here. But it had to be done. If you didn't do it, well, you had no business there. If you'd done a bit of overtime in my time, you got ten pound and four shillings. But you had to do overtime then. And that wasn't great money. I don't think half the people in, the, in this town be alive today only for the bacon factory. It kept the, half the, all the town going, I'd say, and outside the town. Like all you had to do there when the bacon factory was flying is look, stand at the door at dinner time, and it's six o'clock in the evening, and see the amount of people that used to come out of there. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. It was hard work on it at times, I'd say, but it was brought in the bread and butter on the table, but I'd say there isn't a house on McHale Road, there's 116 in it, I'd say there wasn't a house that has at least one member of the family was in it at some stage or another. And there were some whole families who were in it at one time. It was a great place. I'll take you home again, Kathleen. Across the ocean, wide and wide, to where your heart has never been since first you were my bonny bride.
The economic boom in the 50s on the road became evident, and as employment levels in both the bacon factory and the local hat factory increased, the O'Malley's arrived to set up a local hardware and grocery shop that became a focal point on the road in more ways than one. Well, it was a small room first, because at that time there were council houses, and uh, of course uh, it was home at the council, and you just had the shop in it, and... Uh, so then some, what is it, about maybe 20 years afterwards, give or take, uh, it was offered to the tenants by the council to buy the property. So my father bought and he extended the shop. About 1959, I think it was, around that time. After that, anyways, uh, the shop was handed over. I got married to my wife, Kay, myself, and we, we started running the shop. The, the red book. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was oh, that was a great book. It was, it was, yeah, it was. It was a great book. But I must say one thing, and all great people on the road that carry that little red book. We trusted them, and they trusted us, and it was, it was nothing but trust. Like, times are hard in them times, very, very hard, and after all, it wasn't everybody even, even got work. The, any bit of work there was anybody was in the bacon factory, in the hat factory, and after that, it was very, very little. So, um... So naturally, that people had hard weeks, and you know, whatever they could pay, that was it. And good and well, maybe a week or two afterwards, they, you know, that's how it went. Like you went out in the country, you know, they all say, "I'll pay when the cow calves," and that's the same thing. Like, yeah, it was a community shop, you know, it was really community, and you know, even Chris was here, she'd be in, she'd have a old chat, and even Kay mixed in great. My wife came from Lewisburg, and but after inside a year. I think she, she mixed very, very well with the locals. And, you know, there were some great people on the road, really great people. And uh, I see Johnny me here and Johnny's mother and father. They were ideal people, no doubt about it. They were lovely people, Mrs Feeney, the neighbours. And, oh, I could go on and go on. Mrs Roach, Thomas Roach, and I could go the whole. And, of course, we had good characters. We had Frank Dacey and Katie Dacey. They were very good characters on the road. And... You know, and a great story, like, you know, you didn't have to be out, you didn't have to go out to get entertained. You, the, uh, should I say, well, the entertainment came in, you know, that, and they were great characters, really. Yeah, we used to have a great, oh, it was a nice, lively shop. I liked to have it that way and a good atmosphere and, you know, we had good days and bad days, of course, but, uh, well, if you're talking about the 1940s, it was very, very little because <laughs> all you get that in was peas and beans and, you know, rice and semolina, tapioca, give or take out, you know, biscuits, loose biscuits have been a big tins, you know, they're double sized tins and they were all sold by weight and, of course, potatoes, you know, the usual that time, but not like nowadays, not. Even tea all was loose from, we used to weigh tea from, from an ounce, two ounces, quarter pound, half pound. And uh, sugar was the same way, about five or six different uh, size bags of sugar, two pounds, four pounds, seven pounds. And, and I remember we were, we were uh, nine pounds. And I was asked by a customer, what the hell is wrong with me? I didn't put making 10 pounds, make it even. Like, you know, but that's like, that was all weighed up and you know, all, everything was loose that time. You know? And uh, I remember one particular time, I never forget, it was about three o'clock in the morning to the two last deliveries I had to make. And the orders were in banana boxes. And one was down to the late, to the late uh, sis Dunn. And she lived down there to my father Mehan place. And the other one was my next door neighbour in Appan Road. We went back to Appan one day after we extended the shop in 1966. But anyways, uh, so I was down with the neighbour next door and she said, will you have a drink? Well, I said, I will. We got and sat down just having a drink with herself and the husband. And she knows she, after a few minutes, she said, no, Kevin, she said, that's not my order at all. You have to bring it in, she says. And I looked in the box, oh God, I said, it's a stone's order, I said. Hold on, this is three o'clock in the morning. Off me back again, right through the town again, up to Father Meehan's place with this order. But Sis was still awake and up. And she said, I was expecting you to call back, she said. And that was, I suppose, half past three then, you know. So that was an example like what was going on at that time, you see, you know. that just, I was, I said, I retired there in 2000 and uh, I, said, I missed the road terribly. I missed the people on the road. I won't deny it. Liam Egan married into McHale Road. He was always impressed by the community spirit of the place and how quickly the natives adopted outsiders into their ways of living. McHale Road had such a strong, strong sense of community that if you were going out with somebody from McHale Road, if you married somebody from McHale Road, it's a bit like the Mormons. You were almost adopted into the, the road. Now, I didn't live in the road very long, but I would have had that connection with it. 
but as I say, I married into McKay Road, and it's just it's it did it's it was a community. It was a very different way of dealing with things from perhaps Newport Road, where I grew up. Now, I mean, I was born down in Davis Terrace, so I mean, it's hard to Castlebar. Um, and a lot of the people in McHale Road, because McHale Road was tied to the to the bacon factory, in the sense of they all worked in the bacon factory, I think that created their sense of community. And it was different. I mean, and special is probably the, is the best word you can use for it. It was a different, they did things in a different way. Their community was tighter than our community, even though our community was very close. Um, the one thing I would have noticed about McHale Road was that there was one way in and one way out, if you understand what I mean. And that created this notion of a closed community. And they all had the same, they worked in the same job. And uh, you were only going on to McHale Road for a specific reason. Whereas living in Westport Road or Newport Road, people were going to Ackill, if you understand what I mean. So you didn't own the road, but people in McHale Road did tend to own the road. Because of that, it was a slightly different way of dealing with things. I mean, the other thing about McHale Road, which was... A little bit unusual, and I, I, it fascinated me because I have a, I still teach it. Uh, I mean, I have a fascination for local history and folklore was the fact that because many of the people in Mikhail Road had moved in, um, and it was a big influx. And at the time, we're talking about the you know the nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties. We're talking about a hundred houses. That's a huge big influx in a small town, not just from the country, but from other towns and other places. And they brought some of the customs with them that didn't exist elsewhere. So little customs like they would ring a bell and go out and dance in the street on New Year's Eve. Nobody else did that. Um, the weights, which they still, which you know, is still maintained, came from places like McKay Road. And the weights is not necessarily an Irish tradition. That's you know what the weights are—the ones that go around at Christmas. Um, that's exists in parts of the north of England but it would have been brought in so there was a couple of traditions like that that they would have brought with them smaller ones maybe insignificant to the rest of us but set them aside as being slightly different uh, than we were what it done is it has added it adds to the richness of the town so my friendships with God rest him Ned Fair and people like that would have been a serious richness of because we were gaining from one another we were passing information on to one another you know silly 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 things like which would be of no significance to an adult but when you're nine or ten in the 1950s this is major significance we played different kinds of crocs or marbles totally different games and they played one kind of game and we played another kind of game now that would sound very silly um, and but that was important because that was because now i ended up knowing two games <laughs> The swinging 60s brought a new atmosphere to the road. The older generation regaled and remissed about their own childhoods, whilst the youngsters headed to the dance halls and the crossroads Cayleys. Life on the road was never better, and many characters came into their own like never before. So who were the best-loved personalities on the road? Kevin Guthrie, Johnny Mee, Paddy Moylet, Chrissy Doherty and Michael Feeney had their own favourites. There was a lot of characters on McHale Road. We used to play soccer in McHale Park, which was outlawed when we were young. And George Barkley would give you a kick up the backside, but he'd give his own sons the exact same kick. You know, he didn't treat us any different to them. Uh, he was a great character. Mikey Kilcourse was another one that I remember as a young fella. George Barkley and Mikey Kilcourse used to do the bins together. That time there was nothing to lift the bins on a bare muscle. I often heard the saying about George saying to Mikey one day, he says, Mikey, give us a lift with this one. I think there's rocks in it. The bin was too heavy. And that time they used to have to throw them into a tractor. There was no lifting it up like it is today. But uh, there was there was a lot of characters on McHale Road. I don't think you could single any one out. You know, there was, there was some gentlemen on McHale Road, um, nicest men you could meet. There was women, the women too, you know, there were great characters. I remember going to Nanny Hallerden's house for my mother. I used to have to go over to get stamps off Nanny. Nanny was in the bed. But Nanny always had stamps when someone else didn't have. And you go over and she'd take out the little box from under the bed and she'd have the stamps in it and you give her the money and you bring the stamp over to your own house. You had Lawhi McGinty, taxi driver. Lawhi had cars and vans when nobody else in town really had them. He used to bring the people to bingo, to boxing matches, to football matches. He was a great character. I was always fascinated by Jim Devaney. He was a great character and a great friend of my father's. And he was a wonderful musician, of course. And I remember uh, 50 years ago, he, he was in the Caspar Drama Society and they went to the, the uh, 
uh, theatre competitions in, in Bundorden and he, he won a gold medal. He, he took the part of Dan Dolan in a play uh, called Bridgehead, written by a fellow called Rutherford Mayne. But he was also a great musician, and indeed all of the families were great, the family members were great musicians as well. I thought Jack Casty was always very, very funny. Like, you know, at that time, you see, you could go to England at a very, your way was paid to England. And Jack went over fairly often, so much often, they, they had a joke that he used to go over and time his watch with Big Bin. So he, he went over one time and he, was, and he sent his sister Kathleen a uh, price of a cart of turf, an ass cart of turf. And she was bemoaning and crying about Jack and everything. And uh, she was bringing in the sods of turf to the house and just looked around Clark's corner and there was Jack. He was at home for the cart of turf in. I used to go in to visit uh, Lord of the two of them, Ray characters now, there was Granny Ray, so she was known as, and... Uh, Julia Trisham, there were two great ladies who were widows very young in life, I'd say. Uh, they used to pal around together and they used to do the horses and we known the bet for them. And if one, they wouldn't tell one another what they were doing, horses, but they'd tell them the, ne- the next day when the horse came in, I had that winner, and there'd be a murder between the two of them. And the next day there'd be as right as rain again. What are you doing? None of your business, in that kind of way. Casey Daisy now and Frank Daisy, they were old. And I used to love having a chat with them. And Ali Roach's mother and father. I, I used to pal with two of the girls, and I used to go up tell, and that was Ali's mother's name. And she'd answer the door, and I used to say, as Brady or Andy, we'd be going to the dances. And I used to have a mighty crack, you know? Mighty crack. I'd have to say, Paddy Corcoran, the postman, lived in his 80s. He'd sing songs, he'd dance, right to the end. At bonfires here, on, a, on a, the bonfires would be on the street here, and Paddy Corkerton would be sitting there, and i seen him doing it, 12 o'clock at night till 5 o'clock in the morning playing the accordion, and getting people out dancing on the street. And that, the, everyone would be out, and it was, it was the times of the, the old Viscounts going over with their flashing lights, the winkers going over in the sky. No, no real jets as such, but um, Paddy Cork and I be playing there at uh, the, the old bonfires. You see that that road out there used to be cobblestone on this side, and there was a bonfire on the cobblestones. Those bonfires were on occasion of people coming, getting round, having a, a sing song and a party and a bit of a dance. They were great occasions. But I think Paddy Cork and to me was insurpassable as well for his sense of fun. He was absolutely a wonderful character, and no matter where you met him, he was game for a song. Well, everyone had a nickname. Surely to God, everyone had a nickname. It was, it was nicknames across the board. Paddy Corkin here next door was known as Tattoo. Paddy McGinty was Lawhey. The late Timmy Gannon was the larger. Jimmy Chrisham, who's alive and well up here, is still Cagney. Willie Chrisham, the councillor, and his son thereafter was always known as Pansy. And it goes right down along Johnny Rowan, who again died. Sadly, Johnny was a wonderful character. Great all-round sportsman. And, you know, Johnny was the kind of fellow that he'd play football when he was 60. I seen him. I seen him doing it. Wonderful guy. But Johnny was known as a jobber. They were all, everyone had a, had a name. Um, my brother here was Ozzy, John. He was Ozzy, and he's still known as Ozzy, you know, to, for his friends, immediate friends. And uh, these things weren't taken up as 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 as, as offences because you, you were christened. That was it. Stephen Jordan, a friend of mine, who went to school with me. He was Hooper, and he, he, Stephen got that because simply and solely he got it because he got the hooping cough. <laughs> he was young, and he was hooping for a few weeks. And Hooper stuck with him, Mexico course um, up here. It was it was incredible. It, it, it was a street of nicknames. You were, it was a bit like, I suppose, the Dublin of today, with the John or Jack or Mick or Daz or Mike or... But everyone had a nickname, and it was, it was a sense of fun, a sense of jest. And, you know, people that look around, you, no matter where you were, if you met them in, in Dublin, if you met them in England, London or somewhere, you'd only just shout it or say it, and they'd, they'd, they'd light up. And there was never an offence to it.
Mikhail Road had its fair share of characters, but it also had a particular custom that was rather different. And Josephine Kilcourse and Stephen Guthrie told us more. Oh, the weights. Did you ever hear about the weights? Good morning to you, Mr. and Miss MacDonald and family. It's two o'clock, it's a cold, it's a wet morning. And good morning to you, Mr. and Mrs. Halligan and family. It's two o'clock, it's cold, it's a wet morning. Good morning to you, Mr. Scriney. And good morning to you, Coming Mr. Coming up to Kiel. Christmas. It's two it's a cold Come out and they, they start at 12 o'clock. And they go around all the they go around all over the town as well as McHale Road. And they shout out the time. And we'll say it's two o'clock in the morning. They might say, good morning, Mr. Kikorse and Mr. Kikorse and all the family. Two o'clock on a cold, frosty morning. And they played the accordion and then they play music and the, and the hymns, you know, of Christmas hymns and all. And they still do it. They do. It's going down now in tradition. Stephen knows Kevin called him Butsy. He does it. And... Um, Joel Geraghty. And good morning to you, Patsy and family. It's two o'clock, it's a cold, it's a wet morning. Good morning to you, Mr. Donahue. Good morning to you, Mrs. Callaghan and family. And good morning to you, Mr. Gussie Bartley, Miss Susie Bartley. The it's weights goes o'clock. back it's maybe 150 over. years, I'd say. It's, uh, it's a very, very old uh, tradition, as I say. It was brought in uh, about 10 nights, 12 nights before Christmas. Basically, it's, it's just going around bringing uh, a Christmas in into Castlebar, you know, it's the waiting of Christ, the waiting of Christmas. And we'd start after midnight. And uh, it's uh, good morning, Mr. and Mrs. Guthrie and family. Good morning, Mr. and Mrs. Gibbons and family. Good morning to you, Mr. and Mrs. Leonard and family. The other chap, he'd be playing the accordion, bringing, uh, playing his Christmas hymns, Christmas carols. It, it came from Scotland originally, as far as I, I know. All, all I can tell you is, uh, since I was a little nipper, you know, uh, it's just been going on in this town and uh, just speaking to a woman uh, a year ago, you know, she told me that she was 72 years listening to the Waits in Castlebar. For her, Christmas wouldn't be the same if she didn't hear them. In actual fact, I know my own grandfather done it some years back for a very short time, you know, and uh, there, was some, uh, there was some great characters. There was uh, those two brothers uh, that started it all off, and uh, I, all I know is that their names was McCormick's. How they came up with the idea, I'm not too sure. 1976 it was that uh, Desi Dunn approached me and uh, he told me that Paddy Clark was no longer able to do it. So he asked me would I come on board. And at the time I didn't feel like it because I was working in the bacon factory. And uh, getting up at 8 o'clock in the morning I didn't fancy being out till 3 and 4. But uh, I, I told Desi that I'd go along with him for uh, one year until he'd get a replacement. And uh, that one year is still going on, you know, it's 30 years on now and uh, it, the way it's still continuing. We, we'd set out around the 10th to 12th of December and we'd try and get in maybe six, seven nights. What we would do is cover the same areas because the town has grown so much, you know, over the years and we just don't go into the new estates, you know. Uh, for a start, they probably wouldn't know what we're on about and uh, they'd have no idea. And uh, the estates that we do go into, um, everybody looks forward to it, you know, because they know exactly, you know, what's coming and they, they actually know what time we'd be around it. You know, there would be kids would be walking up and uh, they'd hear the weights. And, and once they heard the weights, it meant that they had to be good or else there'd be no Santa Claus, you know. And uh, that's that's the belief I had about it anyways when I was a child. You know, I remember my parents waking me up just to listen to the soul custom. The people of McHale Road continue to be young at heart. Too young to really be loved. They say that love's the word. And yes, we're not too young to know That love will last two years may go And then someday the miracle We were not too young at all
Those who live on McHale Road know that this place is different. Whatever the future holds, both the past and the present suggest that there are few places anywhere that has the same atmosphere as the road. Kevin Guthrie, Johnny Mee, Paddy Moylet, Fergie McAlin and Mickey Guthrie, along with Chrissy Doherty and Josephine Kilcores, know that only too well. Castlebar is a small city at the moment, but McHale Road sticks out even to this day. Because the people that live in it, they, they, they care about each other. They, if you're in trouble, I, 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 Paddy said it there a minute ago, going back years ago, if you were sick at the bottom end, people would sit up with you all night. But there's no need for that anymore because the hospitals are there. But if you were sick at the bottom end even today, the people at the top end would, would try to help you and vice versa. The, the friendship that's in McHale Road is something else. And the people that have married into it, I think, add to it too, because they have brought us with them. They've, they've become part of it, you know. McHale Road is just something else. It's exceptional. Uh, well, there's something unique, something special, something great about McHale Road, because it's, it's, I think it's especially the friendship between the people of McHale Road. They say like that you can leave McHale Road, but McHale Road never leaves you. And I'm quite a number of years out of it now, but, you know, I need people have the crack have to chat with them, have an occasion to drink with them. And that great love, that great affinity with, with each other is still as strong as ever. And we're immensely proud of Michael Road. I know my brothers and sisters and my own family, some of whom were born in Michael Road, they still think of Michael as being their maternal home, their own nest and they love it. There's something special about Michael Road, besides any other part of the town. The old people that's there, they always keep in contact with one another. And I don't think that you have that in every town, every part of the town. So I go back tomorrow. Yeah. I go back and live in McHale Road tomorrow, yeah. I've never left McHale Road. I was over in England for, for years, but McHale Road is... Anybody ever asks me where I come from, I, can, I always say McHale Road. Because that's where I feel I'm from. My heart has always been there. N never left it from the day I, I, we moved out, you know. We had what? But we had contentment and love. All my family was reared on McHale Road, brothers and sisters. My mother and father were the great people. And there's a wonderful neighbourhood up here. Wonderful, great people, good neighbours. And I love everyone on McHale Road. This programme was produced by Ronan Crell and Tommy Marin. The programme makers wish to sincerely thank all the residents of McHale Road and in particular the contributors to this broadcast. Johnny Mee, Chrissy Doherty, Paddy Moylet, Stephen Guthrie, Phil and May Heenan, Kevin O'Malley, Michael Feeney, Josephine Kilcourus, Ali Roach, Michael Fallon, Mickey Guthrie, Philip Redmond, Mark Roach, Lee Megan, Fergie McAlin and Lily Guthrie. We also wish to extend a sincere thanks to Kevin Guthrie for all his assistance and research and to Pori Cresham and Noel Call and all at Casabar Celtic Football Club. This programme was made with the support of Sound and Vision, Broadcasting Funding Scheme, a BCI initiative.